Welcome to Broken Silicon, a PC hardware and gaming podcast. I am Tom of Moore's Law is Dead. This will be another one of those somewhat bonus episodes. I don't think of it as a buffer. I really enjoy changing things up every episode to keep things interesting. I don't want people to be bored when they listen to this podcast. But this episode will be most comparable to that 7970 episode, why I bring it up so often, why I thought that, or at least for me, it was my favorite graphics card of all time. This episode will be looking back on the era of awesome custom AIB cards, at least the era I remember. There's been awesome custom products in the PC space since PCs have existed. But today I really want to drill in on the late 2000s and how creative manufacturers were with the graphics cards they made. Remember when I entered this space, it was like the, I'd say just after the HD 4000 series or right around there actually. And this was a time where it was just basically AMD versus NVIDIA. Intel wasn't doing anything worthwhile in integrated graphics, um, not even for laptops. And of course, every other manufacturer was basically gone or literally gone. So... You would think there wouldn't have been that much innovation, but I got to be honest, it seems like there was more innovation back then. In fact, this leads into one of the reasons I keep saying the past, I don't know, almost decade of graphics cards have been so god dang boring. It's since 2000, I would say 14 or 15, graphics cards by AIBs have just become more and more the same and more and more, well, stupid in my opinion, right? Giant cards, triple slot, making your PCB sag, no innovation, nothing. There's nothing there. All they're doing is making the heat sick thicker so they can charge another $100. And it looks like it's for, for in my opinion, a 10-year-old half of these cards these days. They, there used to be a lot of professional-looking cards, and now I just rarely see it. You still see it in some of the, I'd say, NVIDIA's Founders Edition. I do actually really like the look of the 5700 non-XT. That's what I like. Not these kids' toys that look like they're made out of Mega Bloks. But let's get specific, right? Let's get specific about what I mean. Because I have three examples. And again, there's probably more. But these ones, I think, really highlight how cool graphics cards used to be. How cool they used to be where there were only two graphics cards manufacturers, AMD and NVIDIA, but the AIBs were making it feel like there were more. So the first example I will give are interesting multi-GPU cards. You know, these dual slot, not triple, dual slot cards that didn't take up any more space than a normal high-end card, and they had two graphics dies on them. AMD and NVIDIA were making tons of cards like this back then. You know, you had the GTX 590, which really wasn't that great, but the HD 6990. Before that, there were tons of dual, you know, cards in the 4000 series, 5000 series from AMD and before that, and they pretty much all worked. There really was this arms race for multi-GPU in the era between the HD 4000 and the HD 7000 series, especially the 5 and 6000 series versus NVIDIA's GTX 200 and 400 and 500 series. You know, Fermi and Tesla versus the those pre-GCN island architectures. And they pretty much all worked. You can look them up. It was rare for a game to not only not scale well, but just not work at all. Whereas now, multi-GPU is academic at best. It is basically completely dead. And that is what I tell people. But it wasn't just limited to the official cards AMD and NVIDIA made. AIBs also just made them for fun. Ones that they thought could fill gaps in the market. I mean, I remember there was the GTX 760 X2, I believe, by Asus, which was all right. The way they marketed it as it was like, I don't know, a seven $800 card, or I think it was six to $700. And they said, hey, it's stronger than a Kepler Titan. You know, that was an interesting solution. But that was already the era where multi-GPU was starting to only work in like three out of four games. So it was a somewhat of a dubious value, I would argue. If we go back a little farther, though, I just want to drill in, in this example, on the PowerColor 6870X2. This was a dual HD 6870. Right now, this would be the equivalent of a 5700 XT. And it worked. 
In fact, the review I saw, it worked in pretty much every game I could find. It didn't scale that great below 1080p, but why on earth would you be getting a card this powerful for anything below 1080p? If you had a 1600p monitor, and that was basically the 4K of the time, you could run it with, I believe, 80%, 90% scaling. 90% scaling on average, meaning there were games where it was literally double, And if there was one game where it didn't work, oh, well, that's the one game. It costs a little more than twice as much as a 6870, but it used only 245 watts while gaming. Think of that, people. 245 watts, basically exactly double, if not a little less than double a 6870. We're talking about if right now, I guess I would say it'd be more comparable to a RX 5700 non-XT. If they made a double 5700, that used around 300 to 350 watts and beat the 2080 Ti by a solid 20%, and it worked in every game. And not only that, let's say it cost 750. This example, of course, was 520, but back then cards were a little cheaper, and you have to account for inflation. But yeah, so put that in perspective. A $750 graphics card that could beat the 2080 Ti while only using, you know, 30, 40% more energy. It was absolutely astounding. And actually back then, since AMD was so efficient at the time, it was about the same power usage as the GTX 580. It was blowing away in benchmarks. That is true innovation in a graphics card from a manufacturer. Not just adding a thick heat sink, not just adding liquid cooling and clocking at 5% faster, but actually making a dual die that didn't exist until they made it. That was really cool. And in fact, it was pretty close to the HD, the official from AMD, HD 6990, well, being $200 cheaper. That's the type of stuff I wish we could still get from these people. Obviously, multi-GPU has to be fixed, but I just haven't seen anything like that for years. And I don't know. It's annoying, honestly, to just see the same big fat cards. But it wasn't limited to dual cards either. If we move forward, and this is a really big example for me, there were also these cards that, while being a single GPU die, were souped up vastly, vastly higher than the average card. Sapphire was renowned for making their toxic additions. And I know you guys right now, some of you might go, well, what about EVGA's Kingpin? Guys, that's a Nothing. That's a firecracker compared to a stick of dynamite for how much they were really pushing these. They were clearly ultra binning as aggressively as they could the top 10% of yields of a card that overclocks well, specifically choosing those models, right? Because they would have a toxic model of this 7770 and they'd usually have a toxic model. They have like four toxic models per AMD lineup. And Sapphire would push these things. They would give them double the RAM you would normally expect. Like I remember seeing a 7772 gigabyte. They would give it a thick vapor chamber cooler, not just gigantic, but actually the most advanced vapor chambers they can get with the densest copper. They would really, really actually give it a good cooler, not just a big, fat, heavy one. And they would give it memory a lot faster than stock. And then also overclock it by as much as 20%, if not more. I remember seeing a 7770 Toxic, 2 gigabyte, not 1 gigabyte, it had double the RAM, that was close to a 7850 for $30 less than a 7850, and it ran at 60 degrees. It was absolutely ridiculous. But the coolest one, of course, I think by far, without comparison, the coolest card they ever made that was a Toxic was the 7970 Gigahertz Toxic. And there will be links in the description to videos where you can see them talking about it. Just put things in perspective, right? The 7973 Gigabyte came out. It was the strongest graphics card on earth. Then the 680 came out and it traded blows. It was maybe a little stronger at stock when it first came out. The 680 was, but it didn't overclock quite as well. If you overclock both, the 7970 would take the lead again. Eventually with drivers, the 7970 blew the 680 out of the water. But let's just go back to 2012 where they were neck and neck, but one overclocked better. The 7970 gigahertz had a 30% higher core clock. 30% than a normal 7970. And about almost 15, 20% more than a gigahertz, that's insane. A normal 7970 
had a stock clock of 925 megahertz. This had a stock clock of 1200 in lethal boost mode. That's right, 1200, not 925. Again, I want you to really put that in perspective to what you can buy now. 30% higher core clocks. Even compared to some of the better samples, it was clocked higher at stock. And it wasn't abnormal to have people get their 7970 Toxics to 1300 megahertz. <laughs> Guys, we're almost a 40% core overclock. So this is the strongest graphics card on earth, at least tied with the 680 for this. And then its core is 30 to 40% faster. This was a Titan, a year before the Titan came out, and they didn't stop there. The memory was also clocked at 16% higher, a 16% higher memory overclock. Again, it, guys, what you got to think of, it wouldn't be if they gave it 16 gigabit per second memory to the 2080 Ti. It'd be like if they gave 17 or 18 gigabit per second. Something that is rumored to not come out until the next generation of cards. They just got the fastest memory they could in decent volumes and put it on there. So we have a 30% higher core clock, a 16% higher memory clock, and then <laughs> they gave it a cooler that kept it under 80 degrees, well, actually under 70, even with this, two 8-pin connectors and six gigabytes of VRAM. This is 2012, people. Six gigabytes. Think about that. Already this card has a ton of memory. It would be like, so let's just say this happens. The 5900 XT comes out uh, next year, 16 gigabyte, 5900 XT. It's like a little stronger than the 2080 Ti. So already you have the strongest gaming card on earth with a ton of memory. And then Sapphire says, here's the RX 5900 XT Toxic 32 gigabyte with... Two gigabit per second memory instead of what, it, depending on if it's HBM, right? But let's say they give it memory like 20% faster and then they clock it instead of, I would imagine, right, the 5900 XT will be clocked at about 1.6, 1.7 gigahertz. And then they just at stock have this at about 2.35 gigahertz. Think about that. Think about if they just did that. A 2.35 gigahertz instead of 1.8 or something. 32 gigabyte card. That's now the card that was already the strongest, but now it has double the memory and it's performing 20% faster out of the box. How much would you pay for that? Because Sapphire only charged like a 40% markup. That sounds like a wonderland in hindsight to me, right? I mean, now we would expect them. How much is EVGA charging for that Kingpin? I think they're charging like $1,900, like $2,000 or more for the 2080 Ti Kingpin. Doesn't even have double the RAM. Doesn't even have 22 gigabytes. What a joke. This was an era where AIBs actually did crazy things, where they actually did aggressive binning, put memory on there that was way above what you would expect. And, I mean, gave you a new class of cards. This is what I mean when I say there were only AMD and NVIDIA fighting each other in the graphics card space, but it felt like there were three or four because you get these abnormal cards like that. I mean, this was truly an interesting time, and I just miss it. I just hope, and there's rumors there will be double the memory toxic additions coming again with this 5000 series. You know, I guess we'll say the RX 5000 series from Sapphire. I really hope they go for it. But the cards didn't always have to get more expensive and bigger. There was also some interesting experimentation going on in the low-profile space. So today, you see every now and then a decent low-profile card come out. I believe there's low-profile 1650s. And I know that during the 7000 series, there were a lot of low-profile 7750s. But what if I told you there was a low-profile 7850? And actually, there was a 6850 before that. That's right. AFOX made a low-profile 7850. Again, the equivalent of what is now the RX 5700. No, this isn't an ITX version. This is half as big as an ITX version of a card. This allowed you to put a card that at the time, right, when the 7850 came out, it was as strong as a high-end card that from the previous gen. This card <laughs> could game at high resolutions, at high settings, 
and it sipped energy. It would fit inside a case the size of a Wii. Not a case the size of an Xbox One, the most oversized console on Earth. I mean, the original Xbox One, of course. No, this fit inside a Wii chassis. And it used one six pin and about 90 watts. And there were no, this wasn't something that AMD had to have happen. This was something where, again, just like those other examples I gave you, the AIBs took it on their initiative to make something to differentiate themselves in the markets. It felt like there was more than two manufacturers because the AIBs were actually innovating on what NVIDIA and AMD laid out before them. Imagine how cool that would be right now. If they took the RX 5700, one company took the best yields, they clocked it 10% lower, massively undervolted it, made it just use a single six pin, and allowed you to put it into a Wii-sized chassis with a low profile form factor. And this is a form factor that I think is woefully unexplored still. There is no reason, right? Obviously you're limited by how much you can cool something that small, but they have a small dual fan design and it fit. And we're pretty much standardized that right now low profile cards can take up two slots. Two slots, low profile. So I don't get it. I don't get why you don't see people and and even a 200 watt power supply can have a six pin on it. They usually do. And if they don't, these cards use so little energy, it is safe to use a Molex to six pin connector. There's no reason we're not doing this. There's no reason there's not a low profile 1660 Ti or it would take more effort, but it's doable, a low-profile RX 5700. It just, it really doesn't make any sense to me that you don't see cool products like this anymore. I mean, we've already got Nano ITX boards. Uh, Let's get a Nano ITX board, get that, and make something, you know, the size, yeah, well, I keep using it, like the size of a PS2. That's what I want to see. Let's make form factors that don't just almost get as small as oversized consoles. Let's make gaming PCs that can play in 4K and take up the size of the smallest consoles. Let's make console players jealous. I wish we still had AIBs doing stuff like that. But again, I haven't seen something this cool for a while. Again, it doesn't count to say, right, the low-profile GTX 950, although cool, Although close, it isn't the same thing. It's just not the same thing as if there was a low-profile RTX 2060. That's just an entirely different league of performance and what they were able to accomplish. All right, so what's my point, right? I brought up three examples. The cool dual cards, the toxic editions, and lightning editions that went far and above what you see now in quote-unquote you know, high-end versions of AIB cooling and low-profile cards that when they appeared had people go, whoa, you could do that? Actually, that's, that's what I would focus on. Whoa, you could do that. People were seeing these form factors, these custom cards that we didn't even think of doing, right? There's no 200 watt 1660 Ti dual card. There's no low profile 5700s. There's no, I don't see yet, although maybe it is coming out, a toxic edition of the 5700 XT with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 20% higher clocks. Clocks that make it beat a 2080 Super with double the RAM at stock for, I guess, compared to before, be, and then they would probably priced it like 600 bucks. Wouldn't that be cool? Again, I'm not even talking about the 5900 XT. Wouldn't that be cool if there was a 5700 XT Toxic from Sapphire? Maybe it uses 300 watts and needs two 8-pins. Maybe it costs $600, which sounds ridiculous, but what if it had 16 gigabytes of RAM? What if it beat a 2080 Super out of the box for the same price as a 2080 Super, but double the RAM? What if it really allowed people who skipped out on the Radeon 7 to have saved 100 bucks and get this instead and know that they've got a true, powerful 4K gaming card with enough memory, right? Well, that's a hole in the market. That's a hole in the market Sapphire should be filling. 
These low-profile cards are a hole in the market. I guarantee people with old systems wish they could pay a little extra to not have to build the new PC. And instead of being stuck by getting a stupid 1650, which is crazy overpriced for the performance, someone, for an extra 30 bucks even, made a low-profile 1660 Ti. There'd be a lot of happy people. If any people who work at these companies hear this, start innovating again. Come on. These fat, sagging cards... Ugh, it's just not interesting for me. All right, let's wrap this up with a couple of reader mail questions. Of course, these will be about graphics cards because that's what this episode's about. And I will remind listeners that if you subscribe to my Patreon as an Unlocked Fourth Core or higher member, you can ask me reader mail questions. That is how you interact with me and get your questions read publicly and answered. Sean asks, how important is it that the PS5 and Xbox are going to be using RDNA? How much performance optimization could that bring to AMD on PC? Well, it's interesting answering this question because they did the same thing with the original Xbox and PS4, which use H, you know, GCN 1.0 technology with customizations for both of them. And of course, then Polaris and actually PS4 Pro was kind of a Polaris Vega hybrid architecture. And that made sure asynchronous compute wasn't ignored. That made sure that FP16 was adopted by a decent amount of devs. However, I feel like this time it's going to be a bigger deal. Just because this is the kick in the butt AMD needs to make sure they leverage RDNA's new enhancements. And these enhancements should make RDNA about as big of a deal as GCN was versus Terascale, right? At launch, GCN 1.0, like the 7970, that series, it was built so that it could use the previous drivers. So they didn't have to rewrite everything for the launch. And just because there will always be games, they figure that they can't have the time to program for. So it better at least work decently with a decent IPC increase there. That's what's going on now. Already we have the 2560 SP 5700 XT performing like 10% worse than a Radeon 7 with significantly more shaders in that one. Well, if you look at certain things, and again, I recommend Gamers Nexus architecture breakdowns of RDNA, there are certain things RDNA can do twice as well per clock compared to GCN. So I'm not, I don't think it'll be a doubling, but I don't think it's absurd to think, relatively speaking, once things get enhanced to their fullest extent, we'll have a 20 to 30% IPC increase over what we're already seeing. Yeah, I mean, eventually the 5700 XT should be firmly ahead of Radeon 7. I don't think it'll crush it, and I, there will definitely be certain circumstances and resolutions where it loses. You're just not going to be one terabyte a bandwidth that's just all brute force right there. But relative to turning, I mean, yeah, that could put the 5700 XT a bit above the 2080 Super, right? While using about the same energy, it will beat it. And that wouldn't have happened if the next-gen consoles weren't using it, at least not as quickly. And this ensures that all of these new game engines being developed right now for the next-gen consoles, and they are new engines being developed, these are the engines where they're really planning to go, we're going to try for photorealism. So this is the era where they will try to skip over the Uncanny Valley in some games and show you full photorealism. And now that they know that AMD has gotten an entire generation, and this is the second time, they expect the third generation. They will be building these engines around our DNA. That is going to be incredible on PC. NVIDIA has a war chest of money. They can pay devs to do a lot of things, but they can't pay them to ignore AMD. They just can't. That's what this win means, and it means, in fact, that whatever NVIDIA does, all engines should be optimized well for our DNA. I don't know how to quantify it, but it couldn't be understated how big of a deal this win was. It basically, I would argue, wasn't an option for AMD to lose. But at the same time, considering they make the best CPUs and disputably great graphics cards right now, that combination, they kind of had to go with AMD as well. The second and final question comes from Carbon Cry. What if NVIDIA revives Fermi and then updates it to compete with Arturis? Is that more viable than revisiting Volta to fix its problems? Mm, no, it is not at all. Fermi is outdated by now. What I would say is Volta and even Turing is basically a compute architecture still. 
NVIDIA kind of tweaks their paths, right? Then they have the luxury to because they dominate the market. So they went Faramy Compute, and then they went Kepler, most gaming focused, but they kept some compute options for the versions where they had the, you know, correct, what do I say, precision levels enabled. And then they said, okay, we were the living, every living shit was scared out of us when we saw the 4000 and 5000 series. It takes a few, it takes three to five years to make an architecture, guys, and realize it. So, what came after seeing the 4000 through 7000 series? What came after Kepler? Maxwell, fully gaming. That's when NVIDIA doubled down and they could afford to because they still have these compute Kepler cards. People say that NVIDIA can afford to have two architectures at once, but it's really just having two at once. They really leapfrog Kepler with a lot of gaming features, but still good at compute. Maxwell strip out almost all of the compute features, make it for gaming, and then boom, Volta, all compute again. And then now we go to Turing, where it's kind of like another Kepler. But now they're in a pickle. As I imagine, their next plan was to go full gaming again after taking a break with Volta Turing Compute Focus. But RDNA is here, and that has met Turing's IPC, and AMD's not sitting still, as I keep saying to you guys. Next RDNA is going to have a lot of new features, I'm sure, over this one, and it will have full console support for those features. I mean, if NVIDIA focuses on gaming only, you know, which I imagine would be more RT cores, less tensor, and other tweaks just for gaming. And of course, again, I'm including ray tracing, but it's tweaked to be more of a gaming ray tracing, not just, frankly, uh, Turing's ray tracing is for professionals, not for getting high frame rates in games, despite whatever they say to you. You know, if they just focus on that, AMD is now doing the same thing. Vega is now being doubled down into all compute. The new generation will be all about that, and they can afford to do that while RDNA is attacking them in gaming. I don't have that much to add to that, except that I wonder what AMD's uh, NVIDIA is going to do about it. It would not surprise me if they are deciding to really make a second Volta generation and then also a second enhancement of Turing that goes more towards gaming, right? Those are the two forks. I think that's the most realistic thing they would do, but of course... They could also just have an architecture that's really good at both, kind of like Kepler was. The problem with Kepler was, even though it was good at compute or gaming, if properly programmed for, it really had to be properly programmed. And that's why its performance fell off a wall. I, I want to say that too, really quick. Guys, Kepler didn't age badly because NVIDIA was nerfing it in drivers. It just had severe weaknesses in its architecture that you had to program for to get the most out of its efficiency. And once NVIDIA stopped focusing all their attention on Kepler, its performance relatively fell off a cliff. It's not because they tried to kill it, guys. That doesn't make any sense. No, I don't think they'd go out of their way to do that. But they certainly weren't afraid to have its performance fall behind so you buy Maxwell. Well, those are the reader mail questions. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's not a buffer one. It's something I wanted to get you guys thinking about how innovative AIBs could be if they really went for how they used to. They really could be doing so much more. But you know what? I think we're about to get Intel in the market and ARM's coming, I believe, as well. Would not surprise me. Would not surprise me if a fifth company was entering. I think graphics cards in 2021 and onwards are going to be brilliantly interesting. And next year is going to be the most interesting it's been in the past five years. Thanks, guys. Broken Silicon, a PC hardware and gaming podcast, is brought to you by me, Tom, of Moore's Laws Dead, and also co-hosted by my brother, Dan. Please visit Moore's Laws Dead at YouTube to see much more in-depth analysis of AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA products and rumors. Also, if you love this podcast, please subscribe and consider giving me a review on your distributor of choice. It really does help. And if you really like this and my other content, please consider supporting me on Patreon at Moore's Laws Dead. Unlocked or higher supporters get to submit questions and have in-depth discussions with me after videos and podcasts. Plus, there are a lot of intelligent people on the included Discord channel that are having some pretty enlightening hardware discussions right now. And I bet they wish you could join them. In fact, I will now give thanks to my NetBurst or higher supporters immediately because I could not afford to dedicate the time or resources necessary to providing this content you like without these supporters. And so, without further ado, well, actually, let me say this. This is not a stitched together edit of every name 
that I have recorded recently. Every week, I say the same thank yous to all the names on my list again, because I want to remember all the people making this possible. On August 1st, the following supporters are at the net burst 10 gigahertz or higher level. Bootman, Hunter Drake, Dean, Ruckus, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, Tomas Paraj, Jesse Blanton, Jordan Betcher, Mohammed Al Kawari, Victor Janecki, Matthew Brubacher, Prime Tech TV, Justin Parrish, Zachary Martin, Terrence Harrod, Carl Marco, Thyrister, The Ninth Dude, Greg Reniger, Kulin Lau, Daniel Cash, Night Rogue 77, Mechanical Philosopher, Michael Costa, Bollocks, Derek Evans, Matthew McMullen, and Christoph Novak. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.